Good morning, Indiana homeschool families, and welcome to the 2021 IAHE Homeschool Day at the Capitol virtually. This is our first virtual Capitol Day event, and we are so excited to have you with us today. My name is Tara Bentley, and I'm the Executive Director for the IAHE. I am very excited to show you all of the great content that we have for you today. I'm a little disappointed that we aren't able to meet with you together face to face, but um, it's cold and there's snow. So there's a lot to be said for being able to do this from home. While it's not as much fun as being able to meet and greet you in person, we get the benefit of being able to bring in speakers from across the country and you get to all enjoy it from home, no matter where you are. Cause I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm actually in Florida and yet I can still be here with you today. And I'm very excited about that. Our amazing IAHE volunteer team has pulled together great content for you. We start off with content design with the entire family in mind. We're going to talk about everything from how a bill becomes a law to sharing with you some spotlight tours at the State House. We're also going to highlight some of the information that you found in your free unit studies with fun facts about Indiana limestone. This afternoon, we're also going to bring you a legislative update so that you can be aware of the issues and the bills that you need to know more about. You'll even hear a couple of messages from your elected officials. We're going to talk to you about different ways that you can stay connected with your legislators, both during the session and all year long. And I'm very excited to share that throughout the day, we have four dynamic, amazing, incredible homeschool speakers. We have messages for you today from Linda LaCour Hobar with the Mystery of History, Mike Smith, president of HSLDA, homeschool pioneer Zan Tyler with BJU Press, and Rick Green from the Patriot Academy. Throughout the day, you'll also see some small, short little messages from the IAHE that highlight some of what we do all year long to help serve Indiana families. If there's anything that we can help you with, please be sure to reach out and let us know. Today on the event dashboard, you'll also find a lot of links and extra content that we hope you'll check out during the break. Today's event is pre-recorded content. If you're watching it live with us, it's a live premiere video. We hope you're enjoying and watching with us as a watch party. The content will be available to watch on demand after the event. Now I know you didn't come here to listen to me speak, and I'm gonna get it out of the way of all the other amazing speakers that we have for you today. I'll be back with you a couple more times, so sit back and enjoy the first virtual IAHE Homeschool Day at the Capitol. standing in front of the Indiana State Capitol. This is actually the fourth state house that Indiana has known. The first was located in Corridon, Indiana. It was a 40-foot square building built of Indiana limestone. By 1821, it had grown too small for the Indiana General Assembly, and they moved the capital to the growing city of Indianapolis. There, the government occupied a building known as the Marion County Courthouse. Finally, in 1831, they decided they were ready for a new state house. They offered a $150 prize for anyone who could design the best state house. Two men won the contest, and by 1835, the third Indiana State House was completed. It was based on the Greek Parthenon and was built of blue Indiana limestone. However, 30 years later, 
it had begun to crumble and the blue limestone was deteriorating. It was eventually demolished and the state house we see today was built in its place. The cornerstone for this state house was laid in 1880. It was a 10 ton block of limestone mined in Spencer, Indiana. What you might not know is there is a time capsule in the cornerstone. It contains a Bible, several coins, local maps and newspapers, and annual reports from government agencies. The total project cost $1.8 million. The building was built in the Renaissance Revival style. The entire outside is veneered in Indiana limestone, and many other materials native to Indiana are used throughout the structure. The first Indiana General Assembly was held here January 6th, 1887. We are here today at the Indiana State House. Since you cannot join us for our regular homeschool day at the Capitol due to COVID-19 restrictions, we have decided to bring the Capitol to you. Welcome to the Indiana State House. When you first come in the doors, you will go through security. Make sure you do not have any weapons or sharp items such as scissors, knives, knitting needles. Take external clothing off such as a coat and place it in the bins along with any bags that you have with you. These will go through an x-ray machine while you walk through security. As a society, our dress code has become very casual, especially over the last year. One place that this is not true is at the State House. Although business casual is recommended, you want to look as professional as possible, which means dress in your best. So today we are in the rotunda of the Indiana State House. If you look all the way up, you can see a beautiful stained glass mural on the top of the ceiling here. Now interesting enough, for years, they didn't know that that was actually up there. If you look at the lights, you can see that they used uh, oil to light the State House. Definitely more cost effective in that time. Now while the State House was wired for electricity, uh, just because of the cost benefits here, they did use oil, which led to smoke rising to the top and covering the stained glass. For a while, it was just this black hole at the top of the uh, State House. It wasn't until they renovated in 1988, when they actually cleaned up top, that they find what we have now as the rotunda. Now, if you take your gaze from the top of the State House to the bottom, we can see how there are fossils, snail fossils, in the floor, in the black marble that they use on all levels of the State House. The fossils were not intended to be there. The uh, marble did come from New Hampshire, so once it got here, then they realized there are snails in the floor. There are a great many statues and busts of significant heroes and citizens around the state capitol. There's even more in the government center and around the grounds. But today, I'm going to talk about eight right here in the rotunda. The eight statues in here represent the valiance of civilization. They were sculpted by artist Alexander Doyle. They were called from Cara marble that came from Italy in the 1880s. Each of them are approximately nine feet tall, and they're eight in total. They represent agriculture, art, commerce, history, justice, law, liberty, and oratory. Starting off with agriculture. This is a sculpture of a female symbolizing agriculture. The figure has more classical features. Um, she wears a hair in, her hair in a bun with two loop braids and is clothed in robes. In her left arm, she holds wheat. Next is art. This statue is depicted as a young female wearing a floor-length tunic. In her right hand, she carries around a palette, and in her left is a paintbrush. Next up is history. Now this is a statue of a female figure dressed in Hellenistic robes. She holds a feathered quill delicately in her right hand. The little finger on her left hand, which holds an open book, is curled slightly, adding a sense of delicacy to her pose. Next up is justice. In Justice's left hand, she holds a sword lightly. Its point is fixed to the base below. Wrapped around the sword's blade are the scales of Justice. Now, an interesting fact about this statue is that out of the eight works, Justice is the only one that had a model. 
Who's your Mary E. Wilson knee was the model for this sculpture. Next up is law. In the crook of his left hand is a large book symbolizing the written law and in his right hand is a staff. His Roman styled robes resemble a toga. His face is wrinkled in vain with deep creases under the forehead and under his deep set eyes. Around his head is a wreath of oak leaves. Next up is liberty. Symbolizing liberty is in the form of a young woman. She wears Hellenistic style clothes and in her right hand she holds a long sword. The point of the sword rests at the base between her feet. And lastly, we have oratory. This sculpture is of a man in Roman styled clothes. He is holding his right hand out in an explanatory gesture and is gathering his robes in his left hand. Once again, these eight statues were sculpted by an American um, to be set up here for us to remember the values of civilization as we visit our state capital. Here we have the Indiana State Constitution. It established the structure and the function of the state and is based off the principles of federalism and Jacksonism. Indiana's constitution is subordinate only to the U.S. Constitution and federal law. Prior to the enactment of Indiana's first state constitution in 1816, the Indiana Tor Territory was governed by territorial law. The state's first constitution was created in 1816 after the U.S. Congress had granted Indiana statehood. The present-day document, which went into effect on November 1, 1851, is the state's second constitution. Now, the interesting thing about the case that it's closed in, it's fire, water, wind, and harsh weather proof, and it's also temperature controlled. In 1816, Indiana delegates met under the branches of an elm tree. It was one of the largest trees of its kind in the world. And under that tree, they drafted Indiana's state constitution. Now its branches have since been trimmed and the trunk was preserved, but the wood that was preserved actually went into making this case. Who's the governor right now? Governor Eric J. Holcomb. He's the 51st governor. Eric Holcomb has been a Hoosier his whole life and became a veteran by serving in the U.S. Navy. The governor holds the office for four years and can choose to run for re-election. The governor is not eligible to serve for more than an eight-year term in any 12-year period. Now, what does he do? Or more importantly, what happens in the governor's office? He is a part of the executive branch of the government. He also has the responsibility to report to the General Assembly every January yearly. As the governor, he also has the job of reading bills and reviewing them. The governor also has to sign legislation for it to become a law. The governor may, in like manner, grant reprieves, commutations, and pardons. The role of the governor is to serve the state. So we are in the state auditor's office this afternoon. The state auditor does work closely a lot with the governor and the uh, secretary of state. They do a lot of financing for all of the state. All of you parents who got tax returns, that came through the state auditor's office as well as um, any construction and rebuilding. All of those projects are overseed by the state auditor's office in here. They are actually one of six of the elected state officials. All right, now the state auditor, the first one, here on the left is actually my father. He was the state auditor. He did have a shorter term than most. Um, however, his job was still very important. And a little not so known fact, actually that tie that he's wearing, I bought him for Christmas, as my siblings would beg to differ. But he had a great time here serving the wonderful state of Indiana. Today we are standing in the House of Representatives in the great state of Indiana. Now, one of the most amazing facts, at least to me, is that the chandelier that's right above my head has a hundred candles in it. And why that number is significant? There's a hundred representatives representing each district in the state of Indiana. House members can serve two-year terms with no limit. The mural that's right behind me is called the Spirit of Indiana. The Spirit of Indiana is a public artwork that was painted by artist Eugene Francis Savage. The mural is 21 feet high and 41 and a half feet wide. It was commissioned in 1961 and was finished in 1964. Here we are standing in the Indiana Senate chambers. The Senate is composed of 50 members, each representing a certain district. 
Senators can serve four-year terms without any term limits. Now, the Senate convenes its annual session the first Tuesday following the first Monday of every year. This is to prevent the Senate from convening on the first of the year. In odd number years, the Senate meets for 61 not necessarily consecutive days, and they must adjourn no later than April 30th. This is typically known as the long session. In even number years, however, when elections are held, the Senate must meet for 30 not necessarily consecutive days, and they must adjourn no later than March 15th, and this is typically known as a short session. And the only time the Senate can convene outside of these dates is if the governor calls a special assembly. And another interesting fact about this room is that the last name of every senator is right up here on the wall for everyone to see. The Indiana Supreme Court is part of the judicial branch of our government. The Supreme Court hears appeals of legal issues. If a person loses their case in a lower court, they can appeal to the Supreme Court to hear their case. The court consists of five justices, one chief justice, and four associate justices. The chief justice of the Indiana Supreme Court is Loretta H. Rush. Justices are chosen by a process known as merit selection. To be eligible to serve on the Supreme Court, you must have practiced law at Indiana for at least 10 years or served as a trial court judge for five years. Justices serve a 10-year term before running for re-election. Justices must retire at age 75. Do you know why the state and federal judges wear black robes? Surprisingly, it's just a tradition that has lasted a very long time. Some justices say they show a commonality. They are all supposed to be working to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law. Many also believe that the black robes symbolize the fairness and impartiality in how justices are supposed to make their decisions. Do you see the owls on the walls? They are symbols of wisdom. The justices are supposed to be wise in the decisions they make. George Rogers Clark was an American surveyor, soldier, and militia officer from Virginia, now known as Kentucky, who became the highest ranking American Patriot military officer on the Northwestern frontier during the American Revolutionary War. He served as the leader of the militia in Kentucky, then was part of Virginia, throughout much of the war. He's best known for his celebrated capture of Kasaoski and Vincennes, which greatly weakened the British influence on the Northwestern Territory. Clark has often been hailed as the conqueror of the Northwest. He left Kentucky to live on an Indiana frontier, but was never fully reimbursed by Virginia for his wartime expenditures. After suffering from a stroke and amputation of his left leg, he became an invalid. He died of a stroke on February 13, 1818. As compensation for his wartime service, Virginia gave Clark a gift of 150,000 acres of land that became known as Clark's Grant in present-day Clark County, Indiana. For his accomplishments, George Clark has many commemorations, including when in 1975 the Indiana General Assembly designated February 25th as George Rogers Clark Day in Indiana. My name is Belinda Hatfield and I am the lobbyist for Indiana Association of Home Educators Action. We are a partner organization with the IAHE. Our mission is to protect homeschooling freedom and parental rights. Some of you may wonder what a lobbyist does. I'm going to give you a brief overview. IAHE Action has a team of bill readers that reads every bill that has to do with education, religious freedom, and parental rights. Bills of concern are then brought to the attention of our director, policy analyst, and myself. Generally, our first call to action is to contact the senator or the representative who authored the bill. The next course of action is to testify before the committee that holds the bill. After the testimony, members of the committee can then ask questions. Lobbying involves a lot of phone calls and meetings with legislators. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, testimony would take place in the State House. Since the pandemic, the House of Representatives has temporarily moved to the Indiana Government Center South Building. This building is located directly behind the State House. 
There is a large conference room with enough room to spread out and ensure social distancing. Each representative has his or her own little table. Some committee meetings take place in this temporary house chamber. Those who wish to testify can either go to a separate room and be televised into the committee meeting or they can testify in the room as long as they maintain social distancing. The podium is surrounded on three sides with a plastic frame so that speakers may remove their masks while talking. Committee meetings are limited to two hours as a part of COVID restriction. Testimonies are limited to three minutes per person. After testimony is given, members of the committee can ask questions of the speaker. Each committee member has a microphone at their seat. All committee meetings and sessions are video recorded and archived on the IGA website. I hope that someday soon you can come and visit the Capitol and see its amazing history and the amazing work that goes on here. Are you enjoying the virtual homeschool day at the Capitol? The video content that we have available is premiering today live on Thursday, February 11th, but we're going to make it available for families to watch later on. But because you're here today and you are watching live with us, you have the opportunity to win a door prize. So here's how you do it. Take a photo of your family participating in our virtual event. Take a photo, a selfie of you together watching it. Moms, take a picture of your kids at the computer. Watch what we're doing. Then post it on Facebook using the hashtag IAHE hyphen capital day. We're going to give away two door prizes, one during the morning session and one at the end of the afternoon. So post your photos and let us know how much you're enjoying our virtual event.
When you homeschool your children, every day is a new adventure. Whether it's discovering gravity, exploring the ocean's depth, or landing on the moon, you'll need equipment and support for your homeschool journey. That's what we're here for. BJU Press Homeschool is committed to equipping you with materials and resources you can trust. We offer great appropriate curriculum that will teach them to think from a biblical worldview and prepare your children for the next step educationally. Take advantage of our all-in-one options for video courses and textbook kits to get everything you need for a successful year of homeschool. Our curriculum options are designed to fit your needs and your schedule. Whatever option you choose, we'll be cheering you on along the way. We're just one phone call, email, or chat message away. And our team of experienced homeschool parents at HomeWorks by Precept is ready to help you find solutions tailored to your needs. You don't have to worry if you can trust our materials, so you can focus on helping your children explore this exciting world. Adventure awaits. What's up everybody? Michael Bowman here with Bowman Legacies. As today we talk about limestone. I want you to know that limestone can be made into some beautiful thing like these amazing statues behind me. And this is a product of what's called cut stone in the mining industry. This product can be carved into everything from pillars to these beautiful sculptures. But limestone doesn't start here. Matter of fact, limestone starts right here in woods just like this. We would come into a place like this, do some core drilling, and remove the topsoil to get to the limestone. Limestone just isn't only cut stone like what we see behind us, but it is actually attributed to every piece of infrastructure in our society today. This gravel right here is underneath the road that I'm walking on right now. The base of that road is limestone. As a matter of fact, if you look into every building, every piece of infrastructure, cities could not exist. Towns could not sprout up if it were not for the roads and the foundations and the buildings with limestone. It's in concrete. It's even in the drywall in your room. So look around the room that you're in right now and realize it would not be able to be there in the way that it is now without limestone. Next time you look at that building, next time that you start to hang some drywall, the next time that you look at the gravel in your driveway, it all came to you through Indiana limestone. And Indiana limestone is shipped all over the country and cut stone is shipped, believe it or not, all over the world. Mining is such an amazing thing here in Indiana and we miners are proud to do it and provide the world with the base element of infrastructure that they need to make the world a greater place. I hope this helped you guys understand a little bit about limestone and mining, and I hope you guys continue to build a legacy that will far surpass your legend. I've enjoyed learning about limestone over the past month. 
Let's see how much you know about limestone. Which of these items contains limestone? True or false, there are over 200 limestone mines in Indiana. Indiana has had four state houses. How many of them have been built from Indiana limestone? A, two, B, three, or C, four? True or false, the Empire State Building was built from Tennessee limestone. The kind of limestone that is used for carving and building is called A. Smooth stone, B. Cut stone, or C. Block stone. What part of limestone did the Celts use to fertilize their fields? What process was used to carve the Indiana limestone used on the Biltmore Estate? It is rare to find a fossil in limestone. True or false, limestone is used in the gravel on your driveway. Thanks for playing this game with me. I hope you learned a lot about limestone. This is my horse, Eden. Welcome to the Indiana Homeschool event. Thank you for inviting me. I'm on the board, executive board for We the Kids, and our mission is to put God back into America's history. If that's what you're wanting for you and your kids, then keep watching because upcoming are three videos that I've done, and I did them kind of a while ago to teach principles of freedom, uh, but the principles still apply today as they did back then. Principles of freedom are important to teach our kids because without them, they can't preserve liberty without knowing what they are. So I uh, have something called Constitution in the Kitchen. So follow me down off the mountain. We're going to go to my house after I get some hair out of my mouth. <laughs> and we're going to have some fun teaching and learning principles of freedom in the kitchen. Follow me.
Olivia Nuttall, I want to welcome you to Forgotten American Stories, Celebrating America's Constitution. Today we're going to be over, going over something in Chapter 1. We're going to learn more about how a pure democracy works and why we don't have one in America. So here's what a pure democracy is. Pure democracy means we the people, which is a whole bunch of us. If you look at this, it's comprised of a whole bunch of different colored beans and some popcorn seeds. Uh, America is full of minorities. We're a group of minorities. There's not one just solid chunk of people here that are one majority group. There's a lot of us. And what a pure democracy means is me and you will have the opportunity, or not, called an opportunity, how you look at it, to research every single issue pertaining to me and to you at the state, federal, and local level because we don't have representatives. It means we the people, the majority rule, and we go ahead and make a vote for what we think is best for everybody at every level. I don't know about you, but I don't have the time to research out all these issues that affect me and you at every single level. So I love representatives. I love being able to elect a representative that I trust who will uphold the United States Constitution and protect everyone's rights, no matter who we are in America. So that's drawback number one of a pure or a direct democracy. The second drawback is that if the, the majority of people, let's say all the green and the black, and, or the, the black and the red and the white beans, decide they don't like the popcorn seeds that live in America, the majority could totally take away the rights or vote out the rights of the mi other minorities, like the popcorn seeds. That's no fun. That's not good. But even if 51%, the majority, don't want popcorn seeds, then the majority rules. So that can apply to anything, to people who live, belong to a different religion or a different race, different skin color, different political belief. The majority rules when it comes to a direct democracy. And so that's why we don't have a direct democracy. We do have a democracy, though. We the people, well, we have a republic, which consists of we the people, or democracy, elect representatives ta -da, to research all those issues out and to make sure all of us have our constitutional rights protected. And that is what makes us a republic. Thanks so much for watching. So glad that we're American. We'll see you next time. Hi everyone. This is Lydia Nuttall and welcome to the Forgotten American Stories. I want to share with you how our United States Constitution works. There are five principles that make our Constitution work so we can be a free, prosperous, and peaceful, happy nation. So those five principles are, we're sovereign, meaning the people rule. It's not a king or an emperor or a dictator. It's we the people make the rules. We make the laws. That's number one. Number two, separation of powers. Not one person has all the judicial, legislative, and executive powers. We split them up. We also have limited powers, meaning whatever powers are given to our federal government and our constitution, that's, those are the only powers that our federal government has. The rest of the powers, the rest of the responsibilities lie on the states or the people, respectively. That's number three. Number four is we have representatives. We, the people, elect the representatives that we want to represent us in our government. And number five is a moral and a religious people. So let me show you how this works. Let's pretend all those five principles are here. And if we want to have a government that works, we need to have those five ingredients. If we have those five ingredients, look what happens. Ooh, you can get closer if you want. We have we got some action going on here, okay? When we have all five of those principles, our Constitution is going to work just awesome. Look at that. So this is baking soda and white vinegar. But let's pretend we want to 
Substitute one of those principles, let's say the white vinegar, with water. What's going to happen? Nothing. What happens if we substitute the baking soda with flour and add vinegar? Nothing. Ooh. Yum. Flat. Or substitute the vinegar and the baking soda with flour and water. Looks the same, doesn't it? Similar, but nothing. So we have to have the right ingredients in the right order in order to have our constitution work. So sovereignty of the people, separation of powers, limited powers of government, representatives, representation, and a moral and religious people. That's how our constitution works. Thanks so much for watching the Forgotten American Stories celebrating America's constitution. I'm Lydia Nettle. We'll see you next time. Lydia Nuttall, welcome to the barn and our babies. I wish they were ours. They're our neighbor's horses. Today, for Forgotten American Stories, we're going to share with you more about our constitutional form of government and how it works and how it's related to these horses. Okay, here we have three sacks of feed. And these horses love these three types of feed all blended in together and makes they work synergistically for the horse's digestive system for their health and nutrition and we can liken them to the executive branch and look a branch oh, the executive branch the judicial branch of our form of government and our legislative branch they are all separate. They each do different things in our government. And it's important that each branch does their specific job. That this branch doesn't dabble in this branch, and these branches don't dabble in here, or they cross mix or, and do each other's jobs. They're, they have the specific jobs they need to do as per our United States Constitution, which are the rules, which give them what powers they're supposed to do and what their jobs are, and they're supposed to follow it. So, executive branch um, executes the laws that the legislative branch, our Senate and House, make. And the judicial branch is the one that makes sure those, co those laws are constitutional. They follow the rules and they protect the rights of everybody in America. So, here's how they work synergistically. Right here we have beet pulp. Beet pulp pellets, the horses love this stuff. Scoop of that, scoop of alfalfa pellets, oh, yum, yum, yum. And a scoop of this yummy horse feed that has lots of vitamins and minerals in it, okay? And we pour water in it to make a nice, warm, like oatmeal mash, they love it. I don't know if you've heard of nickering, but anyway, it all blends together. And look, this is what we get. And the horses love it. Mmm, delicious. So look, let's see if they'll, let's see what they say. If we did this right, if they're all working synergistically, the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of our government, or the alfalfa pellets, the beet pellets, and the yummy, uh, Vitamins, minerals, pellets, or worse, should, we should get a knicker out of them. Hey, girls. What? What do you want? What do you want? Oh, she says she wants it. Yeah, see, they love it. Okay, so that's how our United States form of constitutional um, representative democracy works. Cheers!
Hi, my name is Grace and I am passionate about being involved in government. As a teen myself, I believe teens are the most effective tool that we have to use in being active in government. I believe in equipping teens so they know how to be effective and active in the political process. You may ask, why do teens need to be involved in government? And the answer is simple. We need to protect the freedoms that we have. As a homeschooling community, each one of us needs to stand up and do our part to protect the freedom we have to homeschool. And the best time to protect freedom is while we still have it and not after we've lost it. To have a voice at the state house, you must understand how the process works. Before you go and advocate, for a specific cause, spend some time understanding how the legislative process works. Study how a bill becomes a law. Study how the different houses interact with each other. And find a specific cause that you want to advocate for. Once you are familiar with this process, you can learn how to communicate more effectively with your legislators. While it can seem daunting to first get in contact with your legislator, it is not that difficult. A good first step is to write a handwritten note. Enclose a family picture and let your legislator know that you are from their district, you care about them, and you are praying for them. You can get to know them better by calling their legislative assistant and asking you to talk to them or leaving a message about something you are concerned about. You can also meet with them in person at the state house in a professional setting or in district where they live. Legislators have a very limited amount of time. They are always extremely busy at the state house. So if you take time to schedule a meeting with them, remember that you need to have clear and concise points and a reason for why you came. Make sure that your information makes sense and you are ready for pointed questions at the end. If you are a teenager coming in with your parents or your personally meeting with the legislator, know that they will engage with involved teens. They want to hear what you have to say. And also remember, when you're working with the legislative assistants, they have a lot of stress put on them. So don't rush by them. Be kind and courteous to them too. There are several other unique ways that you can be involved besides meeting with your legislator. Paging was an amazing experience for me. It allows you to have one-on-one -on -one time with your legislator and also to observe what goes on on the floor. You can also come in as a visitor and watch from the gallery and watch the legislative process unfold. Praying throughout the Capitol is an amazing way to feel God's power and bathe your legislator in prayer. You can pray in front of their offices, on in the gallery, above the floor, or in the chapel. All of these are amazing experiences that I highly recommend. You can also sign up for action alerts from conservative media outlets. These give you specific emails to send to your legislator or articles or phone calls to make. I'm here to tell you today from my own personal experience that the little things you take time to do as a teen really matter. After attending Teen Pack Leadership Schools for three years, I feel equipped to be involved in the political process. After listening to one of the legislators present at Teen Pact, I disagreed with a point that he had made. I chose to write him a personal note thanking him for coming and explaining what I disagreed with. I was very surprised a couple weeks later to not only receive a note back from him, but he hand wrote it and hand addressed it himself. When the legislators see that you really care, they care too. Here are some of the things that I've done to be involved as a teen are also great ideas for you to do as well. This summer, I had the chance to campaign for my congresswoman. This is an excellent talking point if you meet with your legislative legislator later to let them know that you helped campaign for them. Writing articles is a very effective way to communicate with other people your point of view and influence them. I was able to write an article for the Indiana Homeschool Magazine. IAG is always looking for people to write content for their blog in their magazine. I hope this video has shown you how you can be affected and how you are needed as a teen, even if your efforts seem small. 
each effort is needed because when they all come together, they make a big impact. I pray today that you would choose to do whatever God is calling you to do. Don't let anything hinder you from doing what you know you should do. Thank you. watching others have all the fun. I always want to be in on the action and involved in whatever's going on in the world around me. I've learned that I don't have to wait till I'm an adult to be involved and to make a difference in my community and state. Especially as homeschoolers, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to stand up and protect the homeschool freedoms that we enjoy. Here are some ways for you to make a difference. First, you can work the polls. It's a great way to be actively involved in one of our constitutional rights. This last summer, I had the opportunity to work the polls twice. It was an amazing experience because I was able to see how the voting process worked and I was also able to work alongside people with vastly different political beliefs than me. It was neat to see though that despite our differences, we all wanted to come together to serve our country. I wrote a short article encouraging other teens to join and serve their country. You can be that encouragement too. Second, to make a difference, we need to be prepared. You can do this by attending a civics or government camp. This last summer, I attended a boot camp called Patriot Academy, where we got to hear speakers from all over the US. They encouraged and taught us how to communicate effectively stay grounded in biblical principles, and stand for truth. We were also able to write, present, and debate bills in a simulated legislature. It was an amazing experience, and it taught me that I can make a difference and stand for truth. Third, if talking isn't really your thing, you can have a voice in the written word. As homeschoolers, we have the opportunity to be a positive face for homeschooling to those who may not know much about it. You could write articles about issues that concern you, or write ebooks, or make short videos that encourage and teach people. Did you download the Indiana Limestone Unit study that was included as part of this event? I wanted to do something to help homeschoolers, so I wrote that unit study. I really enjoyed researching and learning about limestone on the way. I didn't really know much about it before writing this unit study, but I found that in the end, I was the one who learned a lot. Finally, Thomas Jefferson said, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. I like this quote because it encourages me to keep learning and stand for preserving homeschool freedoms. So don't be afraid to step up and use the talents God has given you to stand for truth and serve in your community and government. Hi guys and welcome back. I sure hope that you are enjoying the content that you have seen so far this morning as a part of our virtual homeschool day at the Capitol. I have to tell you how exciting it has been to see so much activity by Hoosier homeschool teens, and you've seen a lot of their work here this morning. We have kids who are committed to making a difference here in our state with the legislature and with our organization. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing what they have shared with you. So next up, I am very excited to have a message from Linda LaCour Hobar. She is absolutely amazing and helps bring history to life. We wanted you to know why history matters, why studying our history matters, and how we can look at the events around us from a fresh perspective. So enjoy our last session of the morning, and then we'll see you back just for a little bit before you go to lunch.
Good morning, parents and students. I have three questions for you. Number one, do ideas shape history in the past? Number two, do ideas influence the choices you make today? And number three, will ideas affect the future? Well, I would answer yes, yes, and yes. Like a sharp knife, ideas absolutely will cut and carve the past, the present, and the future. Now, with just a little time together today, I can't begin to cover all of that. But what I can do as the author of The Mystery of History is to provide three examples from modern time of how ideas have greatly shaped history. Now, if you don't know me or my curriculum, biblical worldview history is my specialty. So I'm going to stay there in that lane and offer some application at the end for you to expand on. Now, the subtitle of this session is, When the Good Goes Bad, You'll Soon See Why. So story number one, the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment was a movement of the 18th century. That's what some philosophers in Europe looked to human reason to better understand mankind. Now, some would call this a turn toward rationalism. This movement wasn't new. Men and women have always looked for better understanding of themselves and the world we live in. Some include God in their search for meaning. Some don't. In ancient times, for example, Western man searched for truth through Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. An Eastern man searched for truth through Buddha and Confucius. Later in history, the West had Thomas Aquinas, Blaise Pascal, and John Locke. And the East had Averroes, Shatoku, and Babur. So what is it that made the Enlightenment of the 18th century any different from other time periods? Well, I would say in part that the philosophers of the Enlightenment, they were broader in their approach to understanding life. So they added nature and politics and education and law and economics and matters of the heart all into their quest for truth. In fact, they did not call themselves philosophers, but rather philosophers. It was a sophisticated term for students of society who analyzed the evils of mankind and tried to make society better. Benjamin Franklin, for example, he was a byproduct of the Enlightenment, always inventing something to make life better. The question remains, were the philosophers successful? Well, it's a good question. And the answer, I think, depends on your worldview. So to better understand that, let me just hone in on one of the most influential thinkers of the Enlightenment, his name, Voltaire. So Voltaire, born in Paris, France, he used his wit and his gift of writing to produce 99 volumes worth of material. Voltaire wrote plays and poems and pamphlets. He wrote essays and satires and history books. Voltaire was always writing something. This is what made him famous. But writing is also what made Voltaire controversial. You see, on one hand, Voltaire wrote scathing articles about how corrupt the monarchs of Europe had become, and they were. He slammed all kinds of tradition that had gone bad. He observed that the government was biased toward the rich and unfair to the poor. So if you were a patriot of France, well, you loved Voltaire and you look to him for reason and rationale. Voltaire was really the progressive voice of his day, and he hoped that reason would raise mankind to a higher level. But Voltaire didn't stop with criticizing the kings and queens of the era. No, he also attacked the church of that time period, calling out all of its weaknesses and its corruption, such as hypocrisy and greed, and the brutal practice of the Inquisition, which, by the way, that was when alleged heretics were burned at the stake. So, yes, there were some problems in the church, and Voltaire called them out. That means that if you were a part of the church system at that time, you despised Voltaire. He would make all of Christianity look bad for the errors and mistakes of a few. Now, I hope you see where all this is going. The ideas of the Enlightenment were positive and negative, depending on your worldview and depending on which part of the Enlightenment you're studying. You see, it was good that man would question the overreach of the government. 
governmental power, it ought to always be checked by its people. That's why we have a representative government, at least in this country. But Voltaire's criticism of the church, it was damaging to Christianity. It led to the distrust of the church and distrust in God. Now, in conclusion, to understand our world today, you want to be familiar with Voltaire and the Enlightenment. The world is not so different now. Doesn't modern man struggle to trust government or faith and sometimes resort to reason instead? We do. Well, let me add, according to the Bible, reason won't save us from corruption. Reason won't save us from ourselves, and reason won't save us from our errors and prejudices and injustices. And I say that with confidence because we are told in Romans 3.10, none is righteous, no, not one. And then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Well, let's move on with ideas, other ideas that shaped history. We're going to turn to the French Revolution. Ooh, here's a doozy of a topic. That was a blur of chaotic events lasting about 10 years. Now, at the heart of the French Revolution was a group of angry middle-class citizens who were pretty much fed up with paying high taxes. Sound relevant? You bet it is. Well, setting the stage, in the 1700s, France was greatly divided by class with the first estate, the second estate, and the third estate. So the first estate, it was made up of the clergy or the church officials, and yes, some were corrupt at that time. Then the second estate, it was made up of the rich nobility, as in the king and queen, the feudal lords, the wealthy landowners. And then the third estate, it was made up pretty much of everyone else from the middle class and the lower class. So that would include businessmen, merchants, peasants, and serfs. Now, the problem with these divisions was that the third estate, they paid the highest taxes and had the least amount of votes in parliament. Ouch. Seriously, between tolls and tariffs and taxes, nearly 50% of middle class wages went to the government. That was to support the entire country and the excessive lifestyles of the first and second estate. Oh, with little voice or little vote on the matter? Does that sound fair to you? Probably not. Now let's move on. As a result of this imbalance, a large mob of the third estate, they stomped out of a meeting and they gathered on a tennis court to demand their rights. Can you just imagine the scene? Ordinary folks were stepping up against taxes and voting rights. I kind of think we should say yay for the people here because they had a good idea. And with this positive momentum, the third estate proceeded to take control of the entire parliament and they renamed it. They called it the National Assembly. Now, I would love to report that this new National Assembly created by the third estate knew exactly what to do with their newfound power. But unfortunately, this was not the case. Out of fear of being squashed by the king, the third estate went a little berserk. Mobs rioted in the streets. Peasants armed themselves with pitchforks and shovels. Hundreds would sack the houses of the nobility. And a very large group stormed the Bastille. It was an old prison, and they were shouting liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, when the king of France, who was Louis XVI, heard about the storming of the Bastille, he said, this is a revolt. A messenger corrected him and said, no, sire, it is a revolution. The messenger was right. It was the French Revolution, and it grew reckless. Now, let's insert a famous figure here, because history is always more interesting when we look at some of its people. So our person is Marie Antoinette. Perhaps you've heard of her. Marie Antoinette was the spoiled queen of France. Now, she soothed herself by spending a ridiculous amount of money. They nicknamed her Madame Deficit because she bought excessive amounts of shoes and gowns and diamonds. She indulged in gambling. She hosted elaborate parties, and she wore her hair so high and extravagant that she could hardly walk underneath it. Now, on behalf of Marie Antoinette, many would say she was the natural byproduct of her environment. It was expected of the queen that she would employ help for 
every move she made. At the Palace of Versailles, where she lived, there were attendants who would dress her, bathe her, feed her, and tie her shoes. It's kind of no wonder that she would grow out of touch with reality. Nonetheless, France was going bankrupt, and she was part to blame. Now, as the third estate grew in power, time was ticking for King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. They were actually arrested for treason by their own people and tried in court. Do you know the famous verdict? Both were found guilty of treason against France and sentenced to death. They were beheaded in public by manner of a guillotine. In sadness and humility, you know, neither one actually resisted their fate. And with the removal of the king and queen, was France now headed in the right direction, having taken care of their tyrants? Well, not quite. The National Assembly dissolved itself, and it would become the National Convention. Perhaps it was a good idea to reorganize, but the new convention didn't hold up any better than the National Assembly. Inside of the convention was great division. Literally, one group sat on the far right of the room and the other on the far left. And from that seating arrangement and strong difference of opinion came the political terms for the right and the left. Hmm, true story. Now, one leader of the far left was Maximilian Robespierre. He was a well-groomed lawyer, and he said his goal was, and I quote, the peaceful enjoyment of liberty and equality, the rule of that eternal justice whose laws have been engraved upon the hearts of men, end quote. Sounds noble, right? I mean, I would say so. Robespierre started with some pretty good ideas about overthrowing the tyranny of the monarchy. But as a member of the third estate, he loathed the members of the first and second estates to the point where he went way overboard trying to denounce them. Robespierre and others formed the Committee of Public Safety. Oh, what a fake title that was. This committee of nine to 12 men did far more than promote safety. It grew into a killing machine. Without trials, Robespierre arrested and sent to the guillotine at least 5,000 nobles in Paris and then perhaps as many as 20 to 40,000 French in the outlying provinces. This rampage of executions has been nicknamed the Reign of Terror. Speaks for itself, doesn't it? Well, this was a clear case of the good going bad. You see, any good ideas that had originally come from Robespierre and the Third Estate, they were being tainted by these barbaric executions. Well, in time, members of the National Convention, they turned against Robespierre and they condemned him to death at the guillotine. And that would actually begin to end the gruesome reign of terror. Are there lessons to be learned from ideas in history? Absolutely. Be careful who you elect as leaders and what methods they use to promote their ideas. You know, interestingly, the French Revolution, it left France yearning for normalcy and stability, so much so that they soon allowed Napoleon Bonaparte to waltz in and become one of Europe's most notorious dictators. He rose to power in the vacuum of despair. So beware, America. The vacuum of despair is very real today and powerful. Now, I've got one more story about the grave influence of ideas on history. Now, this story revolves around Karl Marx. He is most credited for founding communism, which started as a social, political, and economic idea. So Karl Marx, born in Prussia, he would study at the University of Berlin in Germany. And it was there that Karl was greatly influenced by some radical thinkers who would debunk politics and religion. So guess who one of his favorite authors was? It was Voltaire, who had done the same. You know, they had in common a strong sense of humanism, thinking that reason alone would lift mankind. Now, Karl Marx's interests would drive him on to Paris, where he met Friedrich Engels. He was a fellow radical thinker. Marx and Engels really fueled each other's ideas toward how to solve certain social and economic problems of their day. 
So stay with me here. In 1845, together, they wrote German ideology. In 1846, they established the Communist Correspondence Committee. And in 1847, that committee merged with the Communist League. And this is where history happened. Pay attention. You see, it was members of the Communist League who assigned Karl Marx the task of writing the Communist Manifesto. And that was just a declaration of some communist ideas that were floating around Europe. With the help of Engels, Karl Marx wrote the Manifesto and the world would never be quite the same. Published in London in 1848, the Communist Manifesto became the handbook for communist leaders all over the world. So it would be worth our time to look at the main points through the eyes of Karl Marx. According to Karl Marx, economics is the key to understanding mankind. He thought that all struggle was the result of the poor being in conflict with the rich, assuming that the rich would always be greedy and always guilty of taking advantage of the hardworking poor. Now, Karl Marx viewed man through the lens of this constant class struggle. And important to know, Karl Marx was a professing atheist, so he didn't identify man's struggles as having anything to do with sin or our need for a salvation. See Romans 6.23. Now, Karl Marx would label the lower class the proletariat and the upper class the bourgeoisie. And by his definition, the bourgeoisie included landowners, factory owners, business owners, shop owners, and all those who controlled production. It will be helpful to remember this. So let's just say out loud, bourgeoisie. It's a fancy French word, bourgeoisie. All right, so if the thinking of Karl Marx was accurate, that the rich and the poor were always in conflict, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, then the best way he thought to resolve the problems of mankind was to eliminate one of the classes. Guess which one he wanted to get rid of? Marx wished to abolish the bourgeoisie because they privately owned businesses, factories, shops, and land. Private industry is also called free enterprise or capitalism. Remember that too. Communists today still seek to abolish private industry. Well, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx wrote this, and I quote, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, listen up, abolition of private property, end quote. Oh, this is so relevant. Let me please just break that statement down into two bite-sized pieces. So one, Karl Marx believed he could eliminate greed by wiping out capitalism or all private property. And two, he believed he could balance out the haves with the have-nots through the redistribution of wealth. Well, there is more to Marx's theory. Karl Marx sincerely believed that once a classless society existed, well, that it would no longer need a central government. It would become stateless. In his ideal scenario of pure communism, hardworking people would rule the world and need no government at all. By the way, Jesus never supported the existence of no government. He would say, render unto Caesars that which is Caesars. See also Romans 13. Now, the biggest problem with the idea of a classless, stateless world was that it would require great conflict to achieve it. Karl Marx admitted that violent revolution would be absolutely necessary to change any multiple class society into a single one. Marx labeled this step toward communism, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Ooh, just ponder that for a minute. The dictatorship of the proletariat? Who was the proletariat? The working class. In other words, Marx proposed class warfare, even to the point of violence. He was okay with that. I tell you what, Karl Marx was right about the violence. According to the congressional record, 135 million people died under the idea of communism in the 20th century. My friends, much blood has been shed due to the ideas of Karl Marx, which would fuel the Russian Civil War, the Chinese Civil War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and more. Well, very relevant to today, 
In transitioning a society to communism, Marx believed that socialism would have to be put in place. And in socialism, Marx thought, the government would just have to exist to control production and industry until classless, stateless communism could be achieved. In other words, socialism would serve as a stepping stone to get a society from capitalism to communism. Vladimir Lenin, who founded the USSR, he supported this saying, the goal of socialism is communism. <laughs> This is why so many Americans squirm at the ideas of socialism. But that's another topic for another time. I'm nearly done, friends, but I feel I need to point out something that you may or may not realize. Pure communism has never been achieved. There has yet to be a world leader who could effectively apply all of Marx's ideas. Is there any such thing as a stateless government? No. Today, however, there are five nations that are technically stuck in socialism, which is also defined as the government ownership of the means of production, those nations, China, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, and Laos. Mm, the lack of civil liberties in those nations speaks for itself. But let me close with where the ideas of Karl Marx do fall short of biblical teaching. First, as I said before, Marx believed that the heart of man's problems was found in economics. Does the Bible teach this? No, not entirely. The Bible teaches that mankind is created in the image of God, but inherited a sinful nature through Adam and Eve. Now, greed is part of the sinful nature, but not the source of all evil. So Mark started with a faulty view of the origin of our problems. Second, Karl Marx wrongly believed that a perfect utopic society could be made here on earth by the hands of man, who he believed was the highest being. Karl Marx saw no room for God in his idea of a perfect world. He once wrote, and I quote, the idea of God is the keynote of a perverted civilization that must be destroyed, end quote. What does the Bible have to say about God and heaven on earth? Well, from cover to cover, the Bible screams off God's sovereignty. In Revelation 21, it teaches that the Lord alone in his time will restore the earth to perfection. That's with a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Oh, that is the hope of heaven. Well, in summary, what were the good ideas that went bad that I've just mentioned in this presentation? Well, during the Enlightenment, Voltaire attacked the government for corruption but he went on to attack the church and then bred distrust in both. The French revolutionaries, well, they sought to overthrow tyranny, but they became tyrants in doing so. And Karl Marx, well, he wanted to make the world a better place and reduce it to one class, but he promoted atheism and class warfare to reach those goals. Application, hmm, <laughs> it's a little hard. I've only scratch the surface of these very difficult topics. But please do this. Number one, run ideas through the lens of biblical truth to determine if they're the ideas of God or of man. And number two, study world history to have an abundance of stories to glean from. Now, if you need a source for biblical worldview history and more stories, please do look at my series, The Mystery of History, I have four volumes of world history for all ages. And if the idea of another curriculum right now is too much to add to your plate, just consider our audiobook series. Just listen to world history. Or if another curriculum is not going to be enough for your eager students, please send them to me. They can get more through my online classes. I have live, self-paced, or lectures on demand. All to say, I feel we have something for everyone interested in biblical worldview history. And we have counselors available. Just go to www.themysteryofhistory.com. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. I am Linda LaCour Hobar for the sake of the mystery. Wow, I hope you guys have enjoyed this morning as much as I have. We just heard from Linda Hobart a very powerful message, and I hope that you were encouraged to learn more about our history 
and why it matters. I hope that you've enjoyed this morning's spotlights from everything that we've covered. I'm hoping that you grabbed your unit studies, that you've been able to work through all of those. If you haven't, make sure that you have registered. If for some reason you've slipped in here and you're watching today's content, but you did not pre-register for the event, make sure you still do that so that you get your unit studies for free. They will be available after the event, but they'll no longer be free. So make sure that you grab those. Use your lunch break to grab a snack, grab some food, discuss with your family the things that you learned. Enjoy some of the links on our sidebar and be sure to check out the video entries from our contest, How a Bill Becomes a Law. And we'll see you back here shortly.